Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the NCI Community Oncology Research Program Research Bases FRA webinar. My name is Jennifer, and I will be your WebEx host. Before I move into introducing our speakers for today, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Please submit your questions throughout the present submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A or chat panel and select all panelists from the drop down. We will ask as many questions as time allows. If you need to, do, need to view live closed captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online in the near future. We also have a feedback survey. Please take a moment to complete that at the end of today's webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to our speakers. Warda McCaskill Stevens and Ann Geiger. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming online to our pre application webinar. Uh, I am Warda McCaskill Stevens. I'm in the Division of Cancer Prevention and Director of the NCOR and Chief of the Committee on Oncology and Prevention Trials Research Group, uh, which houses NCOR. And I am Ann Geiger. I am the scientific lead for the Cancer Care Delivery Research Portfolio in NCOR. I am also the Deputy Associate Director of the Healthcare Delivery Research Program in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. So what I'd like to do uh, today is to provide a, a brief background, um, an overview of the RFA. We have selected some questions that have come in uh, prior to this session uh, that we will go over after the uh, overview of the RSA. Um, we would not like to focus on the specific aims of the potential applicant. Um, however, because of the nature of what the research bases do, we will talk a little bit about the scientific areas uh, overall for the program. So in terms of the background, uh, NCI has had a community-based research program for uh, over three decades. Um, NCOR started in 2014, and it was uh, incorporation of the legacy uh, community clinical oncology program and its components and the NCI Cancer Centers uh, program. Um, and it was also the inclusion of uh, cancer care disparities research uh, at the inception of NCOR as well. Our foundation is that we are quite aware that uh, the majority of care uh, takes place in the community setting and the research basis is certainly a model of academic partnership with community sites. Our overarching goal is to improve patient outcomes and reduce disparities in, by bringing clinical cancer research studies to individuals in their own communities. So overall, within this network, there are designs and conduct of clinical trials and other human subject studies. And certain of the institutions that are eligible for this program appreciate the addition of the human subject studies that are helping us advance and under better understanding the biology and molecular characterization of our tumors. Our research portfolio includes adults and children uh, in cancer prevention, control, screening, and care delivery, as well as the expertise that we have for quality of life studies embedded within treatment trials. Our unique <coughs> distribution of diverse populations throughout the U.S. Uh, and our increasing focus on adolescents and young adults the elderly, racial and ethnic minorities, as well as sexual and gender minorities, and rural residents into our studies helps us address an important question of the underrepresentation in clinical research. We have an excellent partnership with the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. Our sites uh, well um, collaborate with them in data collection and regulatory support. Um, and uh, this is a very important part for the research bases as we successfully uh, implement our trials and develop them. We um, are interested in integrating cancer disparities research questions throughout our portfolio uh, to enhance our ability to enroll underserved populations and to take advantage of the research ideas that emanate from those programs. Um, this is the webinar on research bases, and uh, the research bases are really the hubs that provide the scientific leadership, the statistical support, and the structure to support the implementation of trials at the community site. They're also available, um, responsible for the data analysis of the clinical research as well. We uh, certainly encourage the research bases to review the community sites as well as the minority underserved sites. Uh, that collaboration is critical to our program uh, 
there have been a uh, few changes, and for new applicants, this would be important to understand uh, the roles of the three components of this program. Um, I have uh, shown here the map, which demonstrates that there are currently funded 34 community sites and 12 minority underserved sites. This is a very, very large network. Um, it is important to understand uh, from the research basis uh, where these sites are and the fact that many of the sites, uh, not only do you do they have the 34 sites, but there are significant uh, affiliations with them. Uh, importantly, uh, many of the sites have state influences that actually uh, are important characteristics for their ability to enroll and feasibility of the conduct of the studies that you develop. Just a few uh, comments about the RSA. Um, as you know, the scientific uh, scope of our program uh, is broad. We have cancer control research to reduce uh, comorbidities associated with cancer and its treatment, as well as the quality of life of the individuals undergoing cancer treatment or those who have a history of cancer. Cancer prevention research to reduce cancer risk, incidence, and mortality is important in our program and is a legacy component and is actually as our um, availability of technology um, and importantly being able to reduce all of the uh, incidence and, and mortality of cancer is very important for us. Um, and the research basis is it is important that um, the expertise to assess these research areas are uh, available within the various committees and executive committees that review the concepts uh, before they are sent to the NCI for review. Cancer care delivery research to improve clinical outcomes and patient well-being by intervening on the patient clinical <laughs> clinical as well as mission as, as well as the organizational factors that influence care delivery is an important incorporation um, in the last cycle of our uh, program. It is important to understand that the research bases um, must conduct research in cancer control and or prevention research and all must do cancer care delivery research. So that in your application, you will need to uh, build upon the expertise or recruit in the expertise for the area that you plan to focus on, uh, as well as the development of the committees uh, that are going to promote and develop uh, these research ideas. The research-based activities include uh, developing and the conduct of the clinical research, as I have mentioned. The in-core community sites, the minority underserved sites play an incredible role in this, and it is the responsibility of the research basis to provide the communication of the science, to provide any training that might be necessary for the concepts, uh, to engage the oncologists the non-oncology specialists who um, interact and are critical for the implementation of the trials. Primary care providers, researchers, patient advocates, and others uh, should be described as well as their roles um, within the research basis. It is important to understand that uh, the research bases that implement cancer control screening prevention uh, in member institutions as well so that the portfolio that is developed in core is made available outside of the in core network. Um, it is also important to understand that the research bases have the responsibility uh, for the applicants who take advantage of the NCORE network. It is a laboratory to which um, investigate-initiated researchers um, access for the NCORE network, and the vetting uh, body uh, for these researchers is actually at the research base level. Um, they develop studies to identify and address determinants of cancer disparities, and that should be throughout uh, the research as well as um, trying to uh, enforce that the participation of underserved uh, should be appropriate in the uh, cancers that are being uh, selected for studies. Um, there's a responsibility to oversee administration of the clinical research, including the data management reporting and required regulatory compliance. Um, the NCORE will have uh, bioassessment banks, and that would be taking advantage of the existing NCTN or the NCI Clinical Trials Network um, as a resource. So in your application, you will be asked to provide the scientific ideas for the collection of the specimens. Um, and I would say that the budget is not to be included in, the, in your application for this supplement. It will be requested at a later time. However, we do want your scientific ideas of why you think specimens are going to help to promote your science. 
We certainly encourage um, the collaboration with other research bases. This is particularly important in some of the large scale trials, and also it is important in areas where we need the power um, in populations that are underrepresented in clinical trials. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Geiger. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to shift slightly to talk more about the mechanisms of your applications. The first thing I'm going to address is the actual award mechanism, which is a UG1, and I want to walk through the phrases in the title so it will be clear uh, what it is that you're being asked to do. Clinical research refers to the NIH definition which in brief involves direct interaction with human subjects to study mechanisms of disease, conduct therapeutic interventions in clinical trials, or to develop new technologies. And I suggest you go to the link shown here and make sure you have an understanding of that definition. A cooperative agreement means that after the award, we here at NCI will provide technical assistance, guidance, do some coordinating work, and participate in scientific activities with the awardees. The term single project incorporates all the NCORE related activities that will be undertaken. And clinical trial required indicates that these grant applications and grant activities will include the conduct of studies that meet the NIH clinical trials definition. Again, you can consult the provided link to learn more about that definition. For those of you who applied previously, there have been some changes in how human subjects and clinical trials information is handled. I'm going to talk about that briefly. The RFA provides some specific instructions that you can use to provide this information in what is called Forms E. In the other project information form, you will answer yes to the question, are human subjects involved? However, you should not propose any specific clinical trials at the time of application, which means you will not complete a study record. Both renewal and new applications must add and complete the delayed onset study record and select anticipated clinical trial. And again, follow the instructions exactly as shown in the RFA. I want to touch on a few things that we want to make sure people are aware of. First, both new and renewal applications are being accepted. Applicants must conduct their research at an institution that has adequate, rep rep excuse me, adequate expertise and in cancer clinical research. Examples of those types of organizations are a cancer foundation, a healthcare research organization, including NCI, National Cancer, National Clinical Trials Network Group Operations Center, or NCI designated cancer centers. There is no cap on the budgets. However, what you propose needs to reflect the actual needs of the work you suggest you would like to do. Please note that this is a six-year project period. It is not a five-year grant that will be most familiar to many of you. So you need to include a six-year grant, a six-year budget and budget for all six years. We have requested a letter of intent this is not required, however, it is very helpful for us as we plan the scientific review process. And I'm going to say this multiple times, and you will hear this again in the Q&A, but it is imperative that you follow the instructions, particularly those shown in the SF-424 application guide and the actual RFA. A few timeline reminders. The RFA was released in mid-June. The letter of intent is due on July 31st. If you choose to submit a letter of intent, you will receive a notice that we have received it. Applications are due on August 31st. Late applications will not be accepted. Our intention is for the scientific merit review to occur in February or March of 2019. 
and our hope is to make awards in August of 2019. And so your six-year period of performance would be August 1st, 2019 through July 31st, 2025. We are providing you with two slides that outline some resources that are available to you. We want you to get the information you need as quickly as possible, so we have separated the resources into two groups. The group you see here on this slide pertains to the mechanics of completing your application. Program staff in the Division of Cancer Prevention and Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences are unable to help with questions about the actual uh, processes you use to apply for grants. I want to specifically call your attention to the SF-424 instructions link shown here. This will take you to a document that goes through the forms item by item and provides extensive guidance for each item in the form. I also want to call your attention to the NIH assist resource and note particularly that there is online help available at that link. The second set of resources pertain to scientific work and the particulars of the RFA, and this is within um, the responsibility of our program staff in our two divisions. First of all, please note that we are going to have frequently asked questions posted either next week or the week after. We will update those periodically. We have received over 100 questions to date, and they are still coming in. So please, if you have a question about the RFA, consult that resource first, as someone else may already have asked the question and we may already have answered it. The NCORE program guidelines are something that I urge all applicants to review. These guidelines contain extensive information about NCORE activities and processes, and this document will be particularly useful for new applicants. And then we do have a program staff email box to which you can direct questions. We monitor this email box on a regular basis and are replying as promptly as possible to the questions we receive. And with that, I will turn the conference call back to Jennifer. Thank you, Ann and Morta, for a great uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to jump into questions from our audience. As a reminder, you can submit questions by typing into the Q&A or chat box and selecting all panelists. Now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Kate. Great. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. We do appreciate all the questions that have been submitted, and our uh, hope is to address as many questions as possible today on the webinar. As Ann mentioned, there will be an FAQ document that will be available in the next week or two, and we do encourage you to uh, continue to send your questions in during uh, the webinar so that we can include those um, in the FAQ as well as answer them on the webinar. So uh, we'll start with some questions that we've received um, in preparation for today. Um, and Anne, I'll start with you to see if uh, you could please answer for us. Does the PI of an NCORE grant need to be an MD? No, Kate, uh, you do not have to be an MD to serve as PI on one of these applications. And are P30 NCI funded cancer centers excluded from this RFA? P30 funded cancer centers are um, able to apply to the NCORE research base, which is the webinar we are currently having. Uh, P30 cancer centers may also apply to be minority and underserved community sites. Um, as would have been noted in the previous webinar, you need to provide justification about what underserved population you are involved with and identify other research strengths. You can get details about that in the Minority and Underserved Community Site RFA. P30 cancer centers may not apply to be a community site. Great, thank you. And Ward, I have a general question for you um, specific to the research plan subsection A. Uh, this section just states you should describe collaboration between adult and pediatric affiliates if applicable. We have pediatric oncologists in three sites who are members of COG, and our question is, will COG members be required to join NCORE during the next six years? 
Thank you very much for that question. We have been in discussions with the Children's Oncology Group as well as NCTN uh, to talk about these collaborations that they have been an interest of ours, and, and particularly uh, in view of our interests of uh, adolescents <clears throat> and young adults. So the NCI is strongly encouraging the sites that have affiliated pediatric practices to join the NCOR based upon our research agenda with an NCOR, which is enhanced by pediatric adult co collaborations. So as you think about your agendas, and particularly in the areas of AYA, this is important to know. Um, sites are encouraging. We are encouraging sites to do this early so that it can be included in their applications um, to incorporate and describe the research collaborations that could take place. And I think importantly um, to note is that in our in this cycle, we have not required letters of support from the research basis. We have left it up to the discretion of the community sites. However, I would like to just inform you that you may be receiving requests for letters of support uh, from the community sites, both the community sites as well as the minority underserved sites. Great. Thank you. Um, and the next couple of questions I would like to ask our colleagues from DEA to um, answer for us. The first one is regarding the evaluation criteria. It appears that the approach, study design, data management analysis section seem very geared towards specific studies. How do we apply this when we're looking at our application? So um, there are five NIH review criteria which goes into every funding opportunity announcement, including this RFA which we are talking about. So that will be considered by peer reviewers. In addition, there will be FOA-specific review criteria for the research basis as well, and reviewers definitely will be considering it along with the five NIH review criteria. So applicants, are, um, applicants really should look at what are the criteria within the funding opportunity announcement and respond to what is required of them based on that as well. Thank you, Sharmila. Can you also provide some clarification? Um, they're asking the difference between attachments and appendices, and can we, att can we provide appendices for the application? So um, essentially, the RFA may request for other project information. All this information should be under item 12 under the other attachments uh, in the form, SF-424 form. Uh, these attachments or the other attachments should not be a part of the appendices. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> now we have a couple of questions regarding IRB approval of the application. One question is, when will the NCI Central IRB review our grant application and be the IRB of record? And uh, the answer to that is no. The NCI Central IRB does not review grant applications. The central IRB reviews protocols on behalf of our NCOR sites. So no, the central IRB will not be reviewing your application. Um, the next IRB question I'll uh, pose to Amy from the Office of Grants Administration. Is the expectation that the RFA application is to be IRB reviewed prior to submission, or can it be after submission since we only have 60 days to complete? Uh, the IRB review documentation is going to be required for applicants who were funded as NCORs, and it is a just-in-time requirement, which means that it's due after the application has been reviewed and scored, um, but must be submitted prior to an award being issued. This should provide sufficient time for the site to obtain IRB review and approval. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, now on to some questions regarding uh, the assist and the Forms E and the, the actual process of the applications. Uh, this is the first time we're going to be using assist for the submission. Um, could you again tell us about the resources that are available and uh, where their postings are? Hi, everyone. Again, um, I want to call your attention to the fourth item on the slide. Um, Though there are a number of resources there to help people with the NIH assist system. And again, these are questions that you need to address through the online help for that system. We here on the scientific programmatic side are unable to answer questions about this system. Thanks, Anne. Um, 
Uh, Sharma, I'm going to pose the next couple of questions to you regarding clinical trial um, information and what is required in the uh, application. How do we complete the PHS human subjects and clinical trial information part of the application? Do we include information for each of the studies that we are currently conducting? So as Anne has already talked to you about, and I'll reiterate what was already said, in the applications, for human subjects, you need to check yes. However, because it is a delayed onset studies, you do not have to give any other information about the clinical trials themselves. Um, so just follow what the RFA says and do not complete the study record or the inclusion enrollment information. Great, thank you. Uh, where do we now have um, <clears throat> some questions coming in regarding um, research-based specific items? Um, the first one is looking at requirements under facilities and other resources. It appears that there are three documents required, one, facilities and other sources, two, summary of collective bodies and committees, and the third is constitution and bylaws. However, this element of the application is only a single upload. So do we up combine all three of these into one PDF to upload them? Absolutely. These can be combined into a uploaded PDF one. Great. Um, the next question is regarding the, quote, report of studies template that's referred to in attachment five in the other attachment section. Could you buy, provide some additional information on what the report of studies is? Yes, this is any template or form that you might use, and it, uh, those of, uh, if any of the uh, potential applicants are, are currently NCTNs, then if there is an NCTN template or you whatever form that you might use um, in, as a means of communicating to uh, your participating sites when trials opening, when they're closing, or any updated safety information. Great. And we have an additional question that's come in on chat regarding attachments for us. And it is, what specific information are you asking us to supply in attachment eight, DSMB activities, auditing activities, monitoring others? Can you please clarify? Um, this one is looking uh, for, this is probably where you would provide to us um, just confirmation that you're adhering to the data safety monitoring policies. You might also include your data monitoring participants in this one as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and there's a question um, regarding cancer care delivery. What is NCI's expectation for cancer care delivery in the new funding cycle? Uh, thanks for that question, Kate. In the RFA, we have specified the types of studies that will be most desirable. Of course, uh, Warden went over the definition earlier. I will um, note the four most desirable types of studies verbally here. Um, noting in advance, however, that we are very interested in either moving toward interventions or actually conducting interventions. So of the four types of studies we're most desirous of, um, the first would be to identify modifiable factors, particularly at the clinician and organizational level, that can be the target of interventions to improve care delivery. We are also interested in pragmatic trials that will assess the efficacy of interventions aimed at improving evidence-based clinical practice. We would like to see NCOR serve as a venue to test the effectiveness in community settings of interventions that have been shown to be efficacious in academic settings. And we would like to see people assessing the facilitators of and barriers to implementation and de-implementation of effective interventions in community settings. And I would suggest to anyone applying to be a research base that you look at the community and minority and underserved site RFA because we have put some specific expectations about cancer care delivery research in those RFAs. Thanks, Dan. Uh, another CCDR question here is regarding budget. Um, will CCDR budgets be limited in this cycle of funding, or is it up to each of us applicants to determine for CCDR as appropriate based on our program plan? So, Kate, the answer is the latter. Um, there is no cap, and applicants should develop their budget based on the group's resources, staff, and infrastructure, 
and what they will need to successfully develop, implement, and accrue to uh, CCDR studies. And I want to note that in the application, there are some, or in the RFA, there are some specific instructions about budgets. And so in the budget justification attachment, we are asking that people separately itemize those activities that relate to cancer control and prevention and clinical trials on the one hand and cancer care delivery research on the other hand. And in that budget justification, you should include direct, indirect, and total costs for your cancer control, prevention, and clinical trials activity and the same three numbers separately for your cancer care delivery research activities. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne. And we have one more question um, kind of in that same area of budget. It re it's related to level of efforts. We understand that the PI needs to have a minimum effort of 1.2 calendar months on the grant. In the initial in court application, it was fine for the PI effort to be on cancer control and prevention portions of this budget, and the CCDR budget did not get any listing of PI effort. Is that still the case that all of the PI effort should go to cancer control and prevention? So the PI minimum effort may be split between cancer control and prevention and CCDR activities, but it is not required that it be so split. Okay. An additional budget question, um, Warda, is related to imaging. The question is, can we budget for imaging procurement and storage, or will IROC be funded separately to fund NCORE studies? Thank you. Um, what is new in this cycle as approved by the Board of Scientific Advisors is that we will have annual support for these types of activities with IROC. However, uh, you can reference your scientific activities and that our trials are requiring more central credentialing, some central reviews, um, and also some uh, credentialing for some uh, more advanced um, <coughs> IROC techniques. So this will be, the mechanism will be a supplement. This budget may not be included in this grant uh, submission, but it will be an independent supplement that we will request um, after the review. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And um, also on the, the same sort of topic area regarding supplements, another question is, will there be supplements to biobanks that support NCORE research-based science? Or can we budget for collection, processing, and storing non-tumor biospecimens? Uh, within this grant, you should uh, request funding for collection. Uh, the uh, banking of those specimens will also be a uh, supplement, it will be a mechanism of supplement, which will be independent and after the review. Um, it's important to um, Understand that if you, uh, if an applicant is an existing NCTN, that that would be a supplement to their to the existing NCTN. For academic institutions, again, it would be an independent supplement that would be requested after the review. Okay. And um, another question has come in on chat regarding biospecimen banks. Can each research base continue to maintain? Maintain its own existing bank, or are we mandated to use NCTN existing banks? For the in-core studies, the utilization will be of the in-core bank. <clears throat> and just a clarification, I think it's been touched on a little bit already, but just to make sure it's clear for both cancer control, prevention, and CCDR, what is the capitation dollar amount that should be used for budgeting? There is none. Not for, again, for though, either we, for either section. Again, though, um, obviously people should request a budget that is consistent with their proposed activities. Okay. Thank you both so much. Um, I don't have any other questions coming in on chat. Does anyone in the room have any other items that we want to add for this um, RFA before we close? Oh, no. We have one more question that's come forward. Can we add funding for ongoing projects that are currently being funded by our main NCORE grant? Could you repeat that question? Can we add funding for ongoing projects that are currently being funded by our main NCORE grant? Oh, yes. 
Yes. Warder, would you say anything they need to continue the activities that are underway? Absolutely, yes. And any of the ongoing activities that need, would need to be completed in the new cycle should be included in the budget. Great. Okay. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for all the questions you submitted um, prior to the webinar and, and during the webinar. Um, a recording will be posted in the near future. Um, the slide deck will be available later today on the N4 website, um, along with a lot of the resources that were discussed during today's presentation. Uh, please feel free to continue the conversation via email, which is up on the slide right now, if you have any additional questions that were not addressed today or specific to your grant. Um, thank you again for your participation.